Hello friends. Three years ago I installed a bear proof door on my log cabin that I'm building in the remote location of Karelia. The door has a time-tested design with a couple of interesting design ideas that are worth mentioning here. A few words for my first-time viewers. I've been developing my log cabin camp in the northern forest away from people and roads since 2014. During our short summer we have white nights, so I could accomplish a lot, even in the span of one month summer vacation. Here are a few examples of what I was able to build here in five years. I made this primitive fire carved log furniture using trees downed by a severe storm. I built a dam and a small pond with a step-down ladder at the local stream built a hybrid tent slash bed from recycled materials such as this PET rope cut from plastic bottles. I also made a storage dome for slabs and boards using sticks and stretch film. In addition, I cleaned the campsite from falling trees which I recycled for my log cabin construction. I decided to build my cabin without chopping down a single live tree using a round notch reinforced with a square peg, also known as a saddle cope. Many of the downed trees were huge, which is why my cabin was atypically built from extra thick logs. The roof was built from halved logs, with a polymer underlayment installed under the sod to protect the roof members from moisture and UV light. Some of my other bushcraft projects didn't get into this footage, but I will leave the links below. Let's get back to the door story. While installing the bottom logs, I drilled a mortise for the door's bottom wooden hinge and the upper mortise was drilled a year later. So now we need a door with two rounded built-in tenons that will act as primitive hinges to complete the set. Two years ago, I cut narrow boards using a primitive sawmill jig made from two jointed boards and a couple of screws. However, these boards are too narrow for my door design. I wanted to make it bear proof using only two extra wide boards that I milled and dried last summer. I even bought a more powerful chainsaw with a longer guide bar to be able to mill extra wide slabs. Before milling slabs, I resharpened an original crosscut chain to 10 degrees using my improvised vise made from a stump. Besides acquiring a better chainsaw for the task, I made a saw mill similar to the Logos saw or Alaskan mill. However, I realized the jig will not work well for the board's required width as my steel MS-260 couldn't handle even smaller than needed logs. That's ok though, as I know how to cut slabs freehand. It is time to go to the place where I found a huge dried pine. My traditional pack frame made from pine planks, a bird cherry branch and a rope cut from a bottle will help me to bring my tools, food and video equipment to the site in one trip. I highly recommend you to make or buy a pack frame if you do similar activities in the woods. I found this dried pine last summer not far from my camp. The bottom section has started to rot, but the rest of the trunk is still intact and dry. It is quite dense too. It is not difficult to cut a branchless tree trunk. All you have to do is to cut out a deep wedge on one side and make a partial straight cut a little higher on the opposite side of the trunk. Then you simply hammer in a wedge into that straight cut. This is one of the easiest and safest ways to cut down a tree. However, if the tree is asymmetrical in shape or has a lot of its branches on one side, you will might need to use a different method. I dropped this dried pine on a few skinny logs that I laid out in advance. This way it will be easier to mill the door slabs later. I have two doorways in my cabin, so I need to cut four wide slabs for two doors. I cut the slabs longer than needed, as you can always cut them shorter. 
naturally dried northern pine is called kelo in Finnish because it is considered to be valuable. In natural circumstances, very old pine trees usually die while standing and then slowly dry for years. Kela logs and slabs are fairly dense and don't crack as they lose wood stresses during natural drying processes over the years while standing vertically. The core of the kela is light while the sapwood is colored gray by fungus that lived there during the drying process. The fungus has been dead in it for years and you can safely use this slab for construction. I actually kind of like its golden grayish glow when you apply oil in it. You can tell that the Kella board is very old and has seen a lot during its lifespan. All of the Kella's sap has fully crystallized by now making the wood extra dense, which means you have to resharpen your carpentry tools more frequently. I have shown how to effectively cut a log into boards without any sawmill attachments in one of my previous videos. I will leave a link to it below in case you wanted to see it in more detail. For now, I will just say this. It is easier and faster to cut large slabs with the bottom tip of your chainsaw using swinging motions than when using mini sawmill attachments. This free-handed slab cutting technique is three times faster and takes half the amount of gas. Those are the numerical facts I was able to measure. Ok, the last slab is milled and I can now check the quality and geometry. All four slabs has my quality control and now it is time to take them back to the camp, closer to my log cabin. I put the glove under the slab to cushion my shoulder and started to make my way back. While carrying the slab, I couldn't help to be glad that the Kela wood is so dry and comparatively light. Also, I was happy that this log was located right on the trail that I cleared a few years ago, so I didn't have to struggle through shrubs or a typical Karelian rocky terrain. Those soothing thoughts were giving me needed strength. And again, a few good words about my trusty pack frame. After feeling pretty tired from carrying the first slab, I decided to carry the rest of them using my pack frame's upper arch as a back support. This unusual carrying technique is a lot more ergonomic, spreading the slab's weight evenly on my arms and shoulders. There was another log section from the same tree that I wanted to mill into slabs, but I had to leave it to rot there because my Steel MS-260 failed me the next day. Look at what happened to each cylinder piston group. Steel Service told me I was using a bad fuel mixture, but they couldn't explain to me why the same fuel mixture poured from one tank didn't do any damage to my 20-year-old Steel MS-180. I wonder if the real reason is that the new MS-260 was made in Brazil, while my trusty MS-180 was still made in the USA two decades ago. There is no time to get upset though. I need to make a temporary woodworking bench under the open sky. I just milled a horizontal surface on a falling tree and stretched a tent above it to get an all-weather temporary woodworking shop with a steady workbench. While making my door with round tenon hinges, I decided to cut out the round tenons first. This way the large board is cut to its size and it is easier to shift it around on my workbench. I took my time to do the layout job because there was only one chance to do it right. I don't have spare dried boards of that size laying around. This is when the carpenter's mantra measure twice cut once really came in handy. I made a couple of precise cuts and carefully shaped the round tenon. The slab got noticeably lighter. There will be two tenons on the door so I shaped the second tenon in the same way. The second board just needed to be cut to size to tightly fit the doorway 
that was installed into the cabin two years ago. This old and expensive hand plane is still doing a decent job in smoothing the slab. Ideally, a jointer plane would be better, but it was too heavy to bring it here, so I will have to work with what I have. It is a pleasure to make shavings with the hand plane. Arguably, it is the most classical woodworking activity out of them all. Now we can shape the square tenons using a handsaw, a chisel and a hammer. Note, the tenons are 52 mm 2 inches in diameter, while the slab is 80 mm 3 and a quarter. Each tenon is cut asymmetrically to be flush with the inner side of the door. Such a symmetry is needed to maximize the door's range of motion and to prevent air drafting. Ok, both door tenons slash hinges are cut and we can join both boards together. My new 2.5 inch wide 6 cm chisel would have come in handy now, but I still managed to do a decent job with a small chisel back then. I cut the angled sides of the sliding dovetail joint using a regular hacksaw. I know it is not an ideal saw to make such cuts, but again, I used what I had at my disposal. It is raining, but everything is dry in my woodworking shop, thanks to the canopy stretched over and I can start to fit my sliding dovetail joint. I rub the piece of charcoal on the plank and it will show where the plank is getting tight inside the sliding dovetail. All you have to do is to use a sharp chisel to slightly remove the marked area and methodically repeat the procedure till you achieve the desired fit. Chiseling is a simple but tedious work that I kind of welcome in such times when it is raining outside and I can't really do any other projects at the camp or in the woods. Of course, it is not necessary to have such a perfect joint fit in the log cabin's door, but since I'm enjoying this process and I have time, why not? When I finished fitting the horizontal door rails, I rounded over the door's back edge. The rounded edge will allow the door to open all the way. Note, it is important not to remove too much of the door's material as it could result in creating a gap between the door and the doorway in the closed position. Ok, the rain finally stopped and I can take the hinged board to the log cabin and try it on. I would say the slab lost almost half of its weight by feel through the whole process. Or perhaps I was too excited to start the door fitting. I tried the board in the doorway many times, each time making small adjustments to the wooden hinges, but it was an enjoyable activity. I've never seen doors with built-in wooden hinges before, which is why even a partial success would have made me happy. As I continued the door fitting process, I grew to like its primitive and reliable design even more. When you come to knock on such a door, you could instantly tell that people who live in the house are hardly superficial. In order to do the full installation of the door with built-in wooden hinges, I had to lift a large sum of weight. This included the doorway's head along with the whole roof that is made of logs and halved logs plus the weight of the wet sod. As you probably guessed, I used two wedges to accomplish this task. The wedges have to be strong, so I made them from the oiliest branches that I could find. I will be honest, I enjoyed that fidgeting process and even thought to myself that perhaps the second door should be a double door like in a saloon but maybe I watched too many westerns back in the day. I owe an explanation as to why I'm making two doors in my log cabin and why they open outside. Some will say they need to open inwards, 
especially in this area where snow can block in the door from outside. Why do you think I made them open outwards nevertheless? Talk to me in the comments below. I'd like to hear your version. I probably tired you with my comments by now, so I will let you watch the rest of the feeding process without them. Okay, now we can assemble two slabs and two rails into the door. To avoid gaps, I decided to play in matching grooves and put a spline in between the boards. I've never used a plow plane before, but I like cutting long grooves with it a lot. A plow plane is a very simple tool. It's literally a chisel-like cutter affixed in a jig at an angle, plus an adjustable side rail. If you leave the side rail in the same position and make two long grooves in both boards, they will inevitably match like a mirror image. Ok, now I will make short perpendicular splines to install them into the corresponding grooves. At that stage I had some difficulties because my makeshift workbench was not specialized enough for the task and I was using a ratchet strap to hold down a short plank. This is when I decided to make a shaving horse the next season. Here is a little preview how it was made the next summer. If there is enough interest in my audience, I will make a separate video about my shaving horse. But let's get back to the door project. I finally have all of the necessary door members in place and it is time to put it all together. If I had made any mistakes in my calculations, I would have to make another door, as the doorway is already installed. But the careful measuring and layout paid off, and this door turned out to be nearly perfect in its dimensions. The assembly process is fairly straightforward, and I will let you watch it while enjoying the sounds of pure bushcrafting. I will only add that I reinforced the rails with dowels and made sure there is an adequate gap between the door and doorway to compensate for seasonal wood expansion and contraction. This is Maxi Gorov from St. Petersburg, Russia. If you like this video, 
Perhaps you could share it with your friends. Let good people watch good videos. P.S. I only produce one or two videos max a month. And if you don't want to miss new content like this, subscribe and click the notification bell to stay up to date with all of the latest content. Due to new YouTube's recommendation algorithm, its notifications have become more erratic and unstable otherwise. I hope to see you back on Advoca Makes.